Hey y'all, let's talk today about taking optimal photos for recap photo projects. So just to give you an idea of what this presentation is going to be, I'm going to try and spend 15, 20 minutes, no longer, and we're going to talk about what practices generate quality photos. We'll talk a bit about drones and the different cameras and all the nuts and bolts with that, but that's not going to be the focus for this. The focus for this is going to be your skills to, to uh, create quality data. We're going to be talking about the Archer, not the Euro, so to speak. So let's, uh, let's take a look at our agenda for today. So today's agenda, creating recap photo projects. So a couple things we're going to really focus on today. So four big things, photo quality themes. So things I see that go wrong and things I see that go well. So I come from Autodesk. I've seen a lot of bad data go through recap. I've seen a lot of great data go through recap. And generally speaking, it, the, when the data is bad, there's no way to fix it when it gets to recap. So the process to collect the data is super important. Uh, I've also done this myself numerous times. I've collected a lot of bad data that I thought was pretty good and it came out like crap. I've collected a lot of great data that came out great. So let me tell you what my experience is in terms of how this all works. Uh, second thing we're talking about, understand the site. So really just create that game plan. So think of a skier that's about to do their gold medal Olympic run. You see them picturing what they're doing. You know, you see them close their eyes and they see them doing these movements. They're picturing how things are gonna go. That's what we're gonna think about. Let's picture how this job is gonna go. And then last thing we'll talk about is aerial ground control. So yes, you need to use it. So part one, photo quality. So these are the themes and these are the themes that can, you know, that can go wrong with your photo quality. So move myself over here. So a couple of things. Uh, clarity, you're gonna want sharp, crisp photos. So you know when your photos, you can look at and be like, ah, the photo looks kind of blurry. Yeah, that's, you know, you're gonna want those sharp, crisp photos. Uh, focus, so especially for object creation, the object should be in focus. Uh, same thing for aerial, everything should be in focus. You know, if you got one really blurry photo, just, yeah, you know, get it out of there. That's gonna, that's gonna create issues. Uh, reflective surfaces, those cause issues for object and aerial creation. So water, for example, is a very popular one for aerial projects. Any sort of reflective glare in, uh, you know, for an object uh, project is going to create issues. Uh, resolution. This rule of the thumb is high as possible is going to be is going to generate better results. And I like this down at the bottom here. Model quality can't exceed photo quality. So if you're looking at your photos and you like what they look like, then that's what your model, your mesh model is going to look like. It's not going to be any better than the photos. It might be a little bit worse, but it's going to be right on par with how the photos look. So keep that in mind before you send things through. Okay, photo coverage. So this is um, this is important as well. So for object creation angle, so uh, you're going to want to get 360 degrees. So you're going to want a photo every five to 10 degrees as you walk around that object that you're trying that you're taking. Uh, for aerial, in the top right, overlap at least 50 to 60%. Uh, for me, I usually go with 80%. I usually find that the, you know, if you have a really large site, you might want to drop down a bit because it's going to cost a lot of crowd credits. But for the most part, for for sites that are less than five acres, going from 60% to 80% is not going to be that much, that many more photos. Uh, occlusions, take extra photos in occluded areas. Uh, background. Try to keep the object as large as possible. So those object projects, so the focal point should be the object, and the background is not the primary focus of when you're taking your photos. Same thing for uh, aerial projects. So keep the whatever you're surveying is in focus. Now you don't want to be taking photos of the trees and the, you know, on the sides. You don't want to be taking photos of the horizon line. So keep the site you're trying to survey is the focal point for the photos you're taking. Number of photos. So 20 is the absolute min for single objects, 75 to 100, 300 is the maximum. So anywhere from, I definitely get above 50, uh, 100 is a good number, 200 is a good number, definitely costs a few more credits. Uh, sites, 200 to 500 is a good number, it depends how big it is. So I've done sites with 80 photos. I've done sites with 150 photos. I've done sites with 250, 300, 500 photos. The more photos you have, the better your data is going to be. The denser your point cloud is going to be. The more information you have. So more photos is generally better. Interference. Make sure there's nothing in front of the camera, especially for an object project. You know, if you got, you know, a limb in the way or something like that, that's going to cause issues. Okay, let's talk a little bit about 
image type for aerial projects. So you have three different types of, there's a lot of different, but three different general types of uh, angles for the drone. So vertical images, top down, zero degrees. So those are great. Obliques, so this is any sort of angle. Um, yes, those are great to include as well. And one thing to keep in mind is when you start bringing in obliques, it opens the door for the horizon line, which you don't want. So I would keep that oblique to less than 45 degrees. And I've seen a lot of successful projects where you fly it once at you know zero degrees, and then the second part of your mission is an oblique. And you fly at a different height just to try and get the, give that aerial project a little bit more perspective. And that works out well for a lot of projects. Uh, oblique image is 90 degrees. This is when I would say no, unless it's an object project. So that would be that 90 degree. This might bring, this would bring up the horizon line for an aerial project. Uh, one couple specific scenarios I've seen this used is if you're doing an aerial site and then say you have a building in the middle of it and you want to take some obliques around the building to include that in your aerial project. Uh, very specific instances, I would really shy away from this because it introduces the door to a horizon line. Okay, lighting. So these are a couple of projects that I've, I've done. So you can see picture on the left here, this is us grabbing some ground control. I'm gonna talk about that in a bit. You can see there's a nice blue sky there. Very bright day, a lot of shadows. And then you can see on the right here, I have a cloudier day. And this was early in the morning, so it was a little bit darker. So we're gonna talk about pros and cons and how one, not really one better than the other in some cases. So lighting, avoid shadows. So fly during midday. Maybe the bright, you know, bright sun isn't the best for certain projects. So if you have a lot of buildings, there's gonna be shadows around those buildings. So maybe more of a cloudy day that has less shadows. Think about it, the Groundhog T is shadow today. So that's a, you know, avoid those for some, some specific projects. Uh, neat consistence, diffuse lighting. Overcast sky can be advantageous, not always is, can be, because you have a little bit less light, but you also have less shadows. So think about the pros and cons. Avoid sun glare. So generally speaking, this happens when the horizon lines uh, initiated or towards the end of the day. So if you find like four or five o'clock on a sunny day, those shadows are just getting longer. Okay, a couple examples here. Left side, this is a survey project I did. This was towards the end of the day. This is like a three o'clock sunny day. See the trees, those are part of the you know, trees, shadows, part of the photos. It's gonna be part of your model. Second thing here on the right, this is at my company. We have a white truck here. This was an object project. When you have a white truck, you need to always think about contrast. So my focal point here is the truck and the sky is in the background is also white. There's not much contrast between the white truck and the white sky. We kept gonna have problems with that. So think about you know, blue skies, great for you know an object project with a white truck. So think about the, you know, you always want contrast between the object and the background. Okay, let's talk a bit about drones. And this is as far as I'm gonna go into the nuts and bolts with drones in terms of uh, camera quality and all that. There's a lot of great drones, there's a lot of great camera qualities and some subtle differences you're gonna see. So two different drones I've flown on site. So we did the same flight and with two different drones it just really just compared the results. So we have a Mavic 2 Pro and the Phantom 4 RTK. The cameras are almost identical. One of the big differences between them the Mavic 2 Pro is that electronic rolling shutter, and the Phantom 4 RTK has a mechanical shutter. And what that really means is that when the drone's flying, so when you have movement, it's the quality of the photo while there, there's movement. So the drone can either be moving or the object can either be moving. So there's examples of like propellers moving with drones trying to take a video of it, and you see the mechanical versus the rolling shutter. So the big difference between it is that when the Phantom 4 RTK is flying, it can be flying at a faster speed and taking photos than when the Mavic 2 Pro is flying. And the photo quality can be will be a bit less with the Mavic 2 Pro because of that rolling shutter. So take a look at this photo, Phantom 4 RTK. So this is the mechanical shutter. So this was flown at a faster speed. This is a higher resolution photo. You can see things look pretty good here. You can even see we have the treads down there in the dirt. So this is, no, this is a good looking photo. Now let's go to our Mavic 2 Pro. So you can see here, this photo isn't quite as good. So you can see it's a little bit, you know, that's just grass there. You can see things are kind of fuzzy. We flew this drone pretty fast. So, and then we flew and then we're like, we need to slow this down a bit. But you can see that with that rolling shutter, you're gonna have a little bit less crisp images when you're flying at a faster speed. 
comparison between the photo quality, so a couple others. So Mavic 2 Pro on the left, Phantom 4 RTK on the right. You can see that, you know, it looks like they're flowing at different times of the day, flowing at the same time of the day. Uh, you can see that the photo on the right is a bit crisper than the one on the left. Same thing for the ground control here. I'll talk about that in a bit. See that point there? It's a little bit crisper for the Phantom 4 RTK than for the Mavic 2 Pro. Part two, ground control. So what is ground control? How does it work? So your photos, they, if you go into, you know, you take any photo, the, the, with the, you know, click on the properties from, with the aerial project, it's gonna have a GPS data with it. Latitude, longitude, and altitude. Is this super accurate? No. Is it ballpark accurate? Yes. Is it enough to survey with and make decisions off of? No. But does it, you know, if you put it in a model, would it most likely be generally in the right spot? Yes, it would. So how, what's the difference between this and our GCP data? So your GCP data is going to be super accurate data at specific points in the model and or specific points on the site. And what you're going to do is you're going to mark that by the drone. The drone's going to see that mark you made. And then you're going to tell that 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 is this XYZ data for point one. So this is us on the site collecting some GCP data. And I've done this, you know, the beginning stages and I've done this towards, uh, you know, with more successful uh, projects. So for example, on the left here, this is a propeller arrow point, actually, but we were spray painting the dirt with washable paint that would mark the number. So big X mark, and we'll take a look at that photo in a second. You can see the one on the right here, this is me uh, surveying one morning on that cloudier day. You can see I'm actually using pine cones with an X on a sheet of paper. Uh, we're gonna talk about how that can be, you know, how that could work, but how the, you know, that's more dependent on your photo quality and how, you know, how when you're processing that. So. But bottom line is we're collecting XYZ data at these specific points. And so two different projects. You need, uh, I believe you need three as a minimum and recap. I always get a minimum of five. Uh, just think about that triangulation on that surface. So, you know, the more elevations that you grab, the better. So there's five points on the left side and then we have five points on the right. And so what happens is that you mark this spot before you fly the drone. So this is where we were spray painting our uh, spray painting the dirt with that washable paint. You can see number two. So we have an identifi identifiable number with it. And then when you go and recap to process it, you add in the XYZ data and it'll most likely isolate the images that it thinks are in it. And then you zoom in to that specific point. So you can see this photo is uh, pretty clear. It's not super crisp. Um, we did fly this drone a bit higher. So it might be a good idea to fly this drone at a lo lower height. And uh, then you can then that uh, then that GCP will be clear, so you know exactly where that point is. So this is an example of not so good photos and not so visible GCP marks. So you can actually see there's two red circles here, one on the top, one on the bottom right, bottom bottom right middle-ish, and those two white squares are actually my sheets of paper with X's on it. So I didn't really have an idea of where that X is. I got to zoom into the middle of the sheet of paper. There's going to be some error with it. So keep in mind that you're going to want to be able to see, you know, if you can see it in the photo, that's going to be the quality of your model. Part three, understand the site. So that Olympic skier, about to go down the hill. Let's envision how we're going to fly this site. So this is one project that I did. This was that cloudier day in the morning. And so, you know, one thing is you want to take a look at the site and really picture where are the elevation changes? Where is the software going to have a hard time understanding the contrast and the elevation? And what are the most important spots in the site too? Where do we want the high accuracy data to be? You know, this is what the elevation is in this specific spot. So for this site, I was, you know, I took some points along the sidewalk and, you know, points four and five on this right hand picture, that was a low point. There was a bit of a ditch there. So that's why I grabbed GCP data there. So. Creating a game plan before you go out and fly is very important. So then this was the plan for what the drone flew. So drone's flying and doo -doo 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 -doo, it's gonna be doing the gonna be doing its grid and taking photos as it goes. And you wanna make sure that the GCP data is visible in the photos. And the more photos you have it in, the better it's gonna be. One thing you notice about this is the Drone flies great to the GCP line. Uh, it's probably a little better to make it a little bit, you know, make that grid if it's larger. Take more photos. It's not fun to go survey a site a second time. This is another thing I learned. For your cars park is going to be included in the model. That's going to be, you know, it's part of your final mesh. 
So if you want that, that's great. If you don't want it, you know, think about where the obstacles are. Do things need to move? Is there fences in the way? Is there, you know, what what phase are we in? Is everything that we, is everything visible here that we want in the model? Can things be moved? Because everything you take a picture of is going to be included in that final model. Part four: Create a plan, mission. So. This is this pit project we surveyed compared to a couple different drone results. So this was taken in recap, and you can see this is where all the pictures were. So this is the interval we were taking them at. Uh, pretty nice grid. A couple different things that I would focus on when you're developing your mission for your drone. So with this platform, this is with DroneLink. It's a paper platform and it connects with my Mavic Mini. So that's a, one of the cheapest drones on the market. And the results came out pretty well. So this is gonna be a bit different than like DJI or you know, other software flying platforms, but the overarching concepts are largely the same. So, front overlap. So 80% what I usually strive for. Um, you can, I, I, would, I, I would go for the 80% side versus the 60%. Things don't always work out well if you're at the bare minimum. Altitude. So for this site, I flew at 150 feet. Uh, there's some large trees on the site, and I wanted to make sure my drone was above it. I didn't want to crash my drone. The lower you are down, the crisper your photo is going to be. So if you have ground control and you're trying to take pictures of your, your targets, uh, flying at a lower elevation uh, could help you out. Speed. So 10 miles per hour. So think about rolling shutter, mechanical shutter, and this also can impact your interval you're taking photos with. So, you know, I always are on the side of take more photos than taking less because if you have more, then you can, then your results are probably going to be pretty good versus if you have less, then you're going to be trying to, you know, it could be hard to combine photos from different days or GCP data isn't out there. It doesn't always work well. So fly at a slower speed, take more photos. Gimbal pitch. So this was those, you know, vertical aerial photos. I didn't take any obliques for this project. Uh, it might have benefited things, but for this, they came out pretty well. Uh, minimum capture interval. So I took photos every two seconds. Uh, that was a bit, I, I could have definitely notched that down quite a bit more to take more photos. And uh, just keep in mind that, you know, the more photos you take, as I've been saying, the, you know, the denser your point cloud, the more points you're going to have, and the more accurate your data will be. So this is a couple screenshots of the of this uh, corner project I did. So you can see the grid looks okay in recap. Recap tends to not always keep them just perfect uh, based on how the grid was flown. But you can see things look pretty good in that lower left-hand photo. We get those nice cornrows based on what our mission was. One other thing, as I alluded to earlier, so definitely think about how we're going to, you know, what is our focal point of our site? And let's make sure that we fly, take photos to include that. So, for example, on the left here, this worked out well because I was just focusing on the focusing on the field. But you know, it's okay to go 10, 15, 20, 30, 50 feet beyond the edge of your you know the edge of your site because you want to make sure that your data doesn't get sparse towards the uh, towards the edges. So the photo on the right, something like that, could have been a little better. So we would have, we would have taken some extra photos. Uh, we would have had some more extraneous data to eliminate when we get you know trimmed down that point cloud a bit. But there's, we're not going to be, you know, dealing with issues of uh, a hole in a specific spot or something like that. So I want to thank you for watching. Uh, definitely, you know, please subscribe to this YouTube channel if you find this stuff interesting. Uh, the more subscribers I get, the more time I get to devote to making videos for you all. So I appreciate your time and uh, have a great rest of your week.